Okay. I'm gonna let Jeremy get his slides up, and I just wanna do, most of you know Jeremy by now, um, and I just wanna tell you, when I first met Jeremy, he was a resident at UCSD, he came to me, and he was on NPH and regular, and never even heard of a CGM. And this was just a couple months ago, no. <laughs> this was a couple years ago, and uh, his control was excellent, by the way. And um, it's just been a pleasure seeing him grow and become one of the prominent uh, endocrinologists in this country with a really strong interest in research and clinical care for people with type one. And this is such a great way to end uh, today's session because not only will it be funny, uh, it'll be informative at the same time. So thank you, Jeremy. And uh, we'll have plenty of time to hang until our Dexcom party tonight. So okay. take it away. Thank you. So I don't know what the actual title of this talk is, but I want to call it How to Be a Successful Drinker uh, with Diabetes. And I like this picture of Homer because it says alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. <laughs> so first I got to get the bad stuff out of the way with when it comes to alcohol. So right, so this is my disclaimer slide, I suppose. Large amounts of alcohol can give you all kinds of issues, right? Liver disease, heart disease, pancreatitis, high blood pressure, horrible decisions, um, which in turn can lead to divorce, jail time, etc. You know, so I'm not endorsing, in, you know, uh, robust alcohol use, but you know, most people do drink, and I think this is something that um, people don't go to their doctor saying, I want to talk about, you know, drinking and, and how should I dose my insulin and things like that, but it's important. So, people with diabetes should never drink alcohol, true or false? I think, yeah. The answer is actually false, so good job. Um, and this is um, supported by the American Diabetes Association, which actually gives us guidelines on how much people should drink. And they say women should have no more than one drink per day, and, and men should have no more than two drinks per day. Um, but I have this picture. Oh. It says the doctor said I'm allowed one beer a day, right? <laughs> so. Keep in mind, what, what is a drink? So a drink technically is 12 ounces of beer or a glass of wine. And you know, and if you go to the bar, they usually give you like a 16 ounce beer or whatever, or you know, a shot of alcohol if that's put in a mixed drink or whatever. But I wanted to go back to this real quick because I wanted to make the point that these are not rollover minutes. You know, if you didn't have, if you didn't drink at all this week, you don't get to build them up and you know, use them all on the weekend. So this is per day, this is not, you can't accumulate these. All right, so this is not one drink. This would probably be 10 or so, but that guy looks pretty happy. All right, so what do we need to think about when we think about drinking? And the, the thing I wanted to say is that when, if you did ask your provider about, you know, what should I do when I drink, they might make some general comment like, you know, drinking causes low blood sugars, or drinking makes your blood sugars go high. Or they'll probably just say you just don't drink or some, something like that. But people make these blanket statements about how alcohol affects your blood sugar, and it's actually more complicated than that. We need to think about a lot of different things. The calories in alcohol, the carbs in alcohol, and guess what? I, I really defy you to show me a beer that has a nutritional label on it. They're not required to put these labels on it. You know, we put all these different things in our body and we count carbs and whatever, but for various rules that you'll never find a nutritional label on a beer. So we have no idea what we're putting on in our body unless we kind of go and look it up or at least think about it. So we got to know the effect of alcohol. So there's carbs and alcohol, but there's also the alcohol itself and these have different effects. And then the effect on uh, maybe alcohol on medications. Okay, so let's just start with some basics. So how many carbs or calories in a beer? So this is starting with an Amsto light, starting on one spectrum of the you know, spectrum here. Um, and what do you guys think in terms of carbs or calories for this? 12. All right, yeah, I don't know what you guys are saying. So uh, <laughs> 95 calories in general, five carbs. This is an extremely light beer. Who here drinks Amsto light? Yeah, <laughs> like the healthy people that went on the run this morning. So, um, so this is kind of, you know, if, if you're into to light beer or whatever, this is where you're at. So I put Guinness up here because Guinness is a, you know, it's a tasty beer, but it's actually one of the more calorie and carb friendly beers. 126 calories for, you know, a 12 ounce thing of, of Guinness is not bad. 10 grams of carbs is, you know, so it's, it's, it's a more kind of diabetes friendly beer that has some flavor. So I have that up here. Um, and I put a Budweiser up here because it's like, you know, a standard beer. 
And it, it gives you an idea of kind of a, a, a domestic beer, 145 calories, 10 grams of carbs. You know, in of itself, not, not too big of a deal, but if you had two, three, four, these definitely start to add up. You know, imagine if you had three of these, that's 30 grams of carbs. That's about a, a can of Pepsi, you know? So keeping in mind, you know, the amount of carbs you're putting in your body when you're drinking is important. So, but we're in San Diego, right? And we like to think that we have some good beer here. And when I say good beer, I mean that we're getting more into these very hoppy, very alcoholic, um, like flavorful beers. And this is um, beermapping.com. A lot of bachelor parties now just go all over the place to different breweries and things like that, which is a lot of fun. So we have Stone. This is something that's made you know, worldwide now. And again, they're very hoppy beers. Um, West Coast or Green Flash Brewing is another one. Ballast Point was literally just sold for a billion dollars. Um, they make these big beers. So, how many carbs and calories in a good beer? <laughs> so, this is a Green Flash West Coast IPA, and IPAs are becoming extremely popular, especially in the United States, and, and I think it's strictly out worldwide. But in this one beer, 219 calories, 20, 20 carbs. And, and definitely, it would not be unusual to have two or three of these. So you're looking at 40, 60 grams of carbs with a couple beers, and you're looking at maybe 600 calories, so you're thinking about you know, a burrito kind of thing at this point. And, and, and I'll come back to this, but the other part about this is when you're drinking, you're usually not thinking in general about this. So you have to go into the things with a little bit of a game plan. So my, my point about this is that everybody has their, fa if you're a beer drinker, people usually have their favorite beer or two, or at least a type of beer that you like. So there's lots of apps, or you can just Google it online. This is called Calorie King. And you can get an idea of, okay, I like, in this case, I just entered Stella. And it has 154 calories, 11 grams of carbs. And you can get an idea, okay, every time I drink my Stella, this is, this is what I'm putting in my body. And again, you might do this for a couple beers just so you have an idea. So I wanted to start with beer because it does have probably the most variability in terms of how many carbs and things are in it. So in general, one beer is about one carb serving or 15 grams of carbs. Give or take some if it's a hoppy beer or an alcoholic beer or a light beer. But it doesn't mean you should bolus for that amount, and I'm going to come back to that. So it's important to know how many carbs you're taking, but when it comes to insulin dosing for alcohol, there's a, there's a big, big cliffhanger I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Okay, so what about wine? So here's a nice, nice buttery Chardonnay from Kendall Jackson. Um, what do you guys think? Calories, carbs? Three or four, yeah. So in general, these are, these are more diabetes friendly. That wine has, has less carbs, less calories, and it doesn't matter that much between white and red. When you get into some of the dessert wines that are really sweet, that does matter. But when people say, you know, like a, a Riesling versus a Chardonnay or versus a, you know, a, a, a Cab or something like that, it doesn't matter that much. So there are some, ca some carbs in wine, but it's definitely a lot less. And some people are surprised to hear this. They think grapes and a lot of sugar and all these kinds of things. Um, but in general, these are, wine is a lot easier to drink with your, your blood sugars. And I'm going to go over to kind of the effects that it has you know, overall. But in general, beer is going to raise your blood sugar because of all the carbs. And wine, it, it kind of keeps things a little bit even. So in general, when we talk about wine, think about five grams of carbs, definitely less than beer, definitely more uh, diabetes friendly. So what about hard alcohol? If you just had a shot of whiskey, how many carbs? Yeah, zero, right? So, you know, like, so when, when people come in to see me and they're my patients and they say, gosh, my A1C is a little high. Well, I've been drinking like, you know, I, I like to mix my scotch at night or whatever. And I tell them, like, that's actually okay. You know, and they're always blown away because you think hard alcohol, you're a bad person or whatever you might think. But it's, it's the most diabetes friendly drink to drink. But this doesn't include mixers, right? So we're in San Diego, hanging out by the pool. You start thinking about these types of drinks, right? Maybe pina coladas or Mai Tais or whatever. So any idea, pina colada, how many carbs, how many calories? A zillion is right. So, <laughs> whoa. whoa. Um, so 500 and something calories. This is just for one pina colada. I have a picture of two, but this is just one. 
61 grams of carbs. So the rum or whatever is in there has hardly any of that, right? Zero carbs, just a handful of calories. But you put all that sugary stuff in there and then it changes everything. So you're starting to get an idea when people say like, oh, alcohol does this to your blood sugars. Well, it makes a big difference if you're having a nice buttery Chardonnay or if you're having a pina colada. And you know, it's still drinking, but there's different amounts of carbs and calories and things like that. So not to um, you know, put everybody off to pina coladas because I love them. And we're here, and I hope people have pina coladas. But when you compare it to a Big Mac, it's pretty close. You know, <laughs> actually a little bit more calorie or uh, carbs and things like that. So again, by all means, go out there and have your pina colada. Just be aware, like, you know, like, what, what would I bolus for a Big Mac? And then you're kind of in, the, in the, the ballpark. And that's just for one. OK. So less alcohol is generally a good way to lose weight. Of course, we kind of know that. But this is what I want to start getting into, is the effects of all these on your blood sugars. And this is a super scientific chart that I designed. Um, that over here, you have foofy drinks that are going to make your blood sugars just go through the roof, right? And feel free to take pictures, post, whatever. <laughs> Put it on YouTube as just a still frame, I don't know. Um, beer will definitely make your blood sugars go up, for sure, especially when you drink the, the more alcoholic ones. Wine, it, 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 if anything, it sometimes it really doesn't change your blood sugar that much in of itself if you're not eating. Some people say wine actually makes them go a little bit low. I'm going to talk about why. And if you're just drinking hard alcohol, just drinks on the rocks, it definitely tends to make you go hypoglycemic. So you can see the range, and everybody see people nodding their heads. You know if you're a foofy drinker or a shot drinker or whatever. And people tend to kind of go in these different buckets. So know what you're drinking and know what, the, what it's going to do to your blood sugars. So what's the best thing to drink with, with diabetes? It's actually hard alcohol. You know, just, everyone just, just go out and have some shots. So. You can get around it if you don't like just sipping whiskey or whatever, mixing it with rum, or there's all these like low calorie mixers. Steve really likes this like Bai drink, B-A-I, that has like very low calorie. It's like coconutty that you can make kind of like pina coladas with that. So if you just do hard alcohol with, with sugar-free mixers, that's actually probably the best thing to drink. And then wine is probably a close second, and then the last, or well, then light beer, and then the worst is probably like, like uh, flavorful beer, which is my favorite thing to drink. So I've, I've done a lot of research on this topic. <laughs> okay, so we t it's not that simple though. We talked about the carbs. What about the alcohol itself? What, what does the alcohol component do? We know carbs raise your blood sugar. If you eat a you know, thing of bread or whatever, it's gonna make your blood sugar go up. But what does the alcohol do? And not to oversimplify this, but alcohol basically does poison your liver. And it makes your liver busy doing other things, namely getting rid of alcohol. And the liver in its natural state actually makes sugar. You know, so if all of you guys are pretty much on pumps here, if your pump fell out right now, three hours later, your blood sugars would be a lot higher, right? Even if you didn't eat anything. That's just what happens because your liver is naturally just trying to like make glucose. And when you drink, you kind of block the, the, the liver's ability to do that. So I kind of think of alcohol as almost working as a little bit of insulin that it's kind of working on your liver to not make glucose. So, you know, don't quote me on that, but drinking alcohol <laughs> is like, it's like taking or increasing your basal rate or getting a little bit more insulin in your system. It's very true. So, this means that alcohol can make you go low, but it's usually overnight or the next day, you know? So people tend to drink at night, right? You know, after dinner or whatever. And you know they do whatever they do with their meals or whatever. But then the alcohol starts working on their system when they're not eating, and it can make them go low. And, it, and depending on how much you drink, it can last you know full 24 hours or so. So if you're really out on a bender, you might notice the next day that you're not bolusing as much, or you know you're going low the whole day, something like that. Okay. So the bottom line is that carbs are going to raise your blood sugar. We all already know that. But the effect of alcohol on the blood sugar is actually going to be to lower it. So this is why you need to know the calories or the carbs and the, you know, the amount of alcohol that you're, that you're drinking. So this is just a picture of something that might happen. Somebody's out drinking, you know, lots of beers, like whatever. And then overnight, um, sleeping, the effect of the alcohol can actually bring your blood sugars down. The key is, and I'm going to talk about this more, not to overreact and take a bunch of insulin here when your blood sugars are high after having all these beers and then go to sleep and then have your blood sugars go low overnight. So what do we do to avoid that? 
How to stop the roller coaster. Always eat something before drinking. That's just a good rule without diabetes. You know, um, I always say that God made pizza and beer for a reason. You want something in your system, you know, so you don't get, you know, intoxicated too fast. Avoid sugary mixed drinks, like not all the time, but it just makes it a little bit harder. You know, if you're going to drink and your blood sugar is going to go up through the roof, it just, it can be frustrating. So you can have your, your sugary drinks, just know that you're going to have to bolus. It might be a little bit hard to kind of control for it. I would definitely take insulin uh, for beer, but not for wine or shots. And then test a lot before drinking, while drinking, before bed. Everybody, you know, or not everybody, but having a CGM makes this uh, a lot easier. But if you don't, and you've had a few drinks, definitely waking up in the middle of the night or testing in the middle of the night is something that's probably not a bad idea. And then always take your basal insulin, maybe even before you go out, for you people on shots. My idea, I used to be on shots, uh, well actually I still, I'm on a combination now, shots and a Frezza. And I try to do things if I know I'm gonna go out drinking to prevent drunk Jeremy having to deal with any diabetes related anything. <laughs> so, you know, because even when I'm sober, I've, I've, I've take, had that, that happen where I take my basal insulin and I put it down and two seconds later I look at it and say, God, did I take that or not? <laughs> even when I'm sober. And so I don't want to do that when I've had a couple drinks in my system. So taking that shot you know, before you go out or whatever can be really helpful. And I'm surprised that didn't come up in the debate because you know, I've switched up insulins and things like that too. So anyways, or if you're on a pump, you don't want to be dealing with the pump infusion site change at 2 a.m. You know, and things like that. So do it before you go out so you don't have to deal with all this other kinds of stuff. So be proactive against drunk you, basically, is the idea. <laughs> Okay, get a CGM, we talked about that. If you've had, I'd say, more than two drinks, if you're talking about three or four, you might want to lower your temporary basal or put a temporary basal on overnight or take less of your, um, your basal insulin, maybe 20% or so. So you never, if you normally take 20 units, you might take 16 or 17 or something like that or do a temp basal because the more alcohol you have in your system, again, it's like thinking you have more insulin in your system. You might need smaller boluses the next day. Gosh, that normally takes six units for that turkey sandwich. Now it seems like you only need four or something like that. Just be aware that that'll happen. Setting an alarm in the middle of the night is not a bad idea. Um, don't take a big bolus right before you go to bed. I would say if you do have to correct you know, at bedtime and you've, you've, had, you've been drinking, doing about a half of a correction of what you normally would because that alcohol is going to have you know, its effect. So the, the bottom line is permit some hyperglycemia while drinking to avoid dangerous hypoglycemia. If you're 200 you know, all night, fine, it's one night. I'd rather have you be 200 all night than 30. You know? So being a little um, on the safe side, you know, being a little hyperglycemic one night isn't going to be the end of the world. But you want to be aware that you know, a low, low blood sugar is a problem in itself. But if you have a low blood sugar when you're intoxicated, you're not going to feel it. You, know, you might not wake up and all these kinds of things. Another reason why a CGM is, is, is extremely important. This is especially for college kids and, and things like that. Um, so this is my Jeremy rule. It has absolutely no scientific proof. But if I'm at the bar and I'm 160, 200, I'm totally fine with that because I think I'd rather just kind of stay in that range than worrying about dipping low and, you know, like if you're at a wedding and you're drinking and you're dancing and then your blood sugar is really going to dip, all these kinds of things. So being a little bit um, on the safe side I think is a good idea. This comes up every once in a while that somebody, like these people will be listening to me and say, well, you said the liver is not working or whatever. Uh, when you're drinking and glucagon works on the, the liver, what if I pass out and I'm drunk and someone needs to give me a glucagon shot, will it work? And, the, and it really does. So I, I hear this from college kids more that they say, I don't carry glucagon because it's not going to work when I'm drunk. And I think it's just an excuse not to carry glucagon. I don't blame them. But it does work. And the bottom line is it might be a little bit of a less effect, but if you need it, use it. So that's just something I leave in there. So other safety tips, have a drinking buddy. Again, just a good general rule. But what I mean by that is somebody that you know, um, <laughs> somebody who knows you have diabetes, right? You know, somebody who knows if your blood sugar, like if you just like slump over in the corner, people aren't gonna say, oh, Jeremy's drunk again. They're gonna say, gosh, you know, I need to do something, test the blood sugar, like, you know, whatever it might be. So somebody knows you have type one and can help you kind of triage things if, if, if you need to. Uh, wearing a medic alert bracelet. You know, people sometimes will say, well, I wear a pump or I wear a CGM, isn't that enough? People will know. And the answer really is no. That paramedics and things like that aren't trained to look for insulin pumps. They're trained to look around the neck and around the wrist and things like that. There are, you know, I'm not wearing one as I'm up here, but I have all you guys to keep an eye on me. Um, 
there are, you know, like these like, like kind of cooler ones that they're rubbery ones that, you know, say so you have type one. So there's ways around that, but I think that is important. Um, or get a type one tattoo, maybe right here or something like that. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed about testing at the bar, or pulling out your CGM. This is something I have to tell myself over and over. Um, if you're, you know, less than 180 or so, I would consider eating a little bit of something to bring your blood sugars up. If you're not going to change your basal rate because you probably will drift down overnight, just a consideration around that same theme of aiming a little bit high. Um, I think that's that's my my last my last uh, slide on that. So with that in mind, uh, the next thing where we have scheduled is uh, well, we are going to take a picture. Um, of everybody, so don't move just yet. But this is the layout for tonight, of six to seven is reception, seven to eight is the dinner, eight to nine is a show, and then after that is uh, we all just get to hang out and do some research, basically. So I think, um, 